Hi guys, this, um, this video is a follow up to uh, one I made recently, uh, War Games Movie Simulator software, the making of, because um, when I made that video, I was still in the process of uh, completing a whole lot of updates, feature requests, whatever that either people had asked for or were already on the roadmap for me to do. So I thought I'd, uh, I'd do a follow up and just show you some of the other features that um, that I've added in since that time. Where to start? Okay, um, let's have a look. So we should be looking at the screen of the simulated MSI 8080 at the moment. And you can see at the moment, same commands there that we had last time, by CLS, dialer, DIR, and Kermit. One of the features that I added in was drive B. Well, actually, I'll tell you what, before we do that, I'm using cool retro term at the moment as my terminal emulator uh, in conjunction with, oh, well, actually I'm running this locally. So I'm just using cool retro term and I'm running the application. So one of the things that we were having problems with last time was the ability to use the backspace key and the reason for that is because um, when cool retro term was starting up it was effectively remapping the backspace key so what i've done is i fixed it in code now so every time it launches the application it'll set it correctly so you'll see now there you go backspace keys working absolutely fine so that's one problem fixed which is um which is quite a big deal really because without cool retro term it, it's you're not really getting the full experience um unless you were to use a, a, an old school um rs232 serial terminal of some description with a crt in which case yeah great that's that's obviously the way to go but in the absence of that especially if you want to run it locally on the same machine cool retro term is a fantastic piece of software so getting that fixed i'm, I'm very pleased with that anyway um one of the things that someone was um, that someone asked for uh frank asked for actually uh who's been um, providing really good uh, feedback to um some of the work that I've been doing on this piece of software. So thanks, Frank. Um, he was asking whether it would be possible to include some additional custom commands. And I'm like, sure, let's have a look at that. So what I've done is included uh, drive B access here. And on drive B, you can use uh, an additional configuration file that I've included, uh, cpm underscore commands dot txt. And in there, you can effectively add your own custom commands. It's a pretty simple format. Uh, effectively, it's just the name of the command um, and then the file extension. So uh, if we take the first one here, hello world, and then com, um, and then whatever it's gonna do. So in this case, if I run that, hello world, okay, you can see it's just outputting hello world to uh, to the screen and literally all it's doing is using uh, a linux echo command to do that so you can run whatever you want now you'll see here we've also got um some uh, some zork games and hitchhiker hitchhiker sky of the galaxy that is so if i run zork one um, that's actually bringing that up and it's running that using frots uh which you can freely install using your software manager probably and then it's running the dat file for zork1 now unfortunately i can't provide that as part of the package um up on github for copyright reasons but you should be able to find it yourself pretty easily um so there you go there's zork i'll let you play around with that at your leisure but um if you want to add more custom commands that's how you do it now okay so just using that configuration file so if we go back to drive a the other thing that um, I've added in, let's have a look. Uh, yeah, we'll come on to that. What I'm gonna do it actually is show you some of the other systems. Um, because we didn't go into a great deal of detail on that last time. No, sorry, I'm sorry, what am I doing? Okay, so we're gonna run dialer for now. Okay, and 
I'm going to come back to some of the other features because what I want to do first is show you some of the other systems and then we'll run through the remaining features. So here, um, the dial list you'll have seen before, no doubt, but um, you'll see that we've got ARPANET internet we know about, bank we know about, Telstar, Night Owl, Simulant, they're all additions. So Telstar is a... Um, a view data service. It's been stood up by John at uh, Glass TTY. So thanks again for that, John. I know we did a, a video on on this previously, but um, I thought it would be worth going through this again as part of the uh, the War Games uh, software because some people just won't have seen it yet, I guess. So effectively, that's it's going to work much the same way as all the other systems. It's basically making a system um, call using a system call from the uh, the dialer program and in this case it's going to run a view data client in this case i'm using vidtex so thanks very much to um, to the author of vidtex and it's a fantastic piece of software readily available on github i've included it as part of the uh, the install so it'll install it when you do a full install of the war game software now and if we have a look at that i'm just going to mute my mic for a second uh, otherwise we're going to get lots of different audio sources clashing Okay, so here we go. Um, so using the um, the Vidtex view data uh, terminal client software, obviously fairly seamlessly integrated, up it comes. Now, view data was used by a number of different systems back in the day, back in the late 70s through to pretty much the mid 90s. Um, one of which, if you're in the UK, would have been Prestel. Uh, if you were elsewhere in Europe, mainly France, uh, it would have been Minitel, which was their kind of equivalent system. And if you, uh, uh, pretty much throughout Europe, I think, but certainly in the UK, um, you had uh, view data read-only services like CFAX and other teletext services. There were quite a few of them. Uh, Prestel was, um, was a bi-directional service, so it was interactive. And Telstar's interactive. There's only a limited number of pages on, on here, but it's enough to give you an idea of how it works. So because of the, the format, uh, it's only actually using half of our 80 by 24 screen, but it is what it is. Can't do much about that, I'm afraid. Um, as part of the install script, it will now include an additional um, beds, bedstead, I think it's bedstead, um, font, which includes the, uh, the characters required to support the, uh, the view data output. Uh, otherwise it would just be well gibberish frankly okay so here we go so there's a few pages on here and as I say it'll look pretty similar to um, to the old teletext services let's see what we got I'm going to rattle through this at pace because I want to show you the other system as well which is um, kind of similar to this but it's got some different content on it so we'll have a look BBC News what we got on there Okay, and you can see, unlike um, uh, unlike CFAX, Teletext, something of that ilk, it, it's interactive. So as I'm requesting pages, they're coming straight down. Whereas a CFAX service, for example, when you requested a page, it, they would just be continuously transmitted, and when the right page came down, it would display it. So that's one of the key differences, I guess. Uh, so look, UK News, what got on there? Yeah, okay, that takes us back to the main page and there's some gateway services on here as well which will connect us out to some other systems okay and let's just have a look at one of these so if we have a look at option three which is nxtel and this is the view data offering as part of the spectrum next uh, yeah it's just telling us we're about to use a gateway service and it's control p if we want to get back so if you've got a spectrum next and you're using the um, the Nextel view data service through that, this is what you're going to see. Same thing. Okay, yeah, let's have a quick look at 
Teletext Art. Okay, and we'll just look at one of those. Oh, there you go. Introspective by the Pet Shop Boys. <laughs> well, I recognize that anyway. Okay, cool. So then we can, on this system at least, we can control P. That'll take us back out of the gateway, back to the Telstar system. Okay, yeah, we can hash to return. Hash, incidentally, is, uh, is return on here. And then if we want to go cleanly through the menu, we can. We can say nine and then zero to log off. And in theory, that should take us out. But whether it does or whether it doesn't, there you go, it has actually disconnected us. But we could have just hit Control C at any point during the session and it would have terminated the session for us because the, the client recognizes a Control C. So there you go, that's Telstar. Um, again, thanks to uh, to John at Class TTY for standing that up. Let's have a look at another one. So this is, um, we're gonna take option E for Night Owl BBS. Now hopefully Brian's uh, in sync with me and he's stood it up. One thing to, to mention, um, Brian doesn't operate this system 24 seven at the moment, but I have arranged a schedule, so hopefully it's up now. Let's have a look, option E. Okay, that's good. So let's see if I can remember my details to get into it. Okay, cool, we're in. Now I've had a quick look at this previously, and the one thing that stood out to me uh, was that Brian had done some really, really good view data artwork. But let's have a look at some of this quickly. So I think probably your best plan is um, if you want to have a look at night owl i would guess that brian's going to keep an eye on the um, the video when it's posted on on youtube if you want to have a look at it just post a comment on there and and you can get in touch with brian directly and uh, let's have a look retro youtube it's got to be okay retro computing sure let's have a look now, if you're anything like me, and you're probably uh, subscribed to pretty much every retro computer channel going on YouTube, you'll recognize some of these, no doubt. So there you go, there's the 8-bit guy. Okay, yeah, Acorn BBC user group, sure. Adrian's digital basement, certainly one of my faves. Owl's Geek Club. Now, I've probably seen it, but I don't, I'm not sure I know that one offhand. I'm gonna to have to check it out now, of course. Yeah, there you go, that's a bit of information. Uh, Center for Computing History in Cambridge. Uh, that's definitely worth a visit if you happen to be nearby. Uh, got a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff in there. Okay, let's see what else. Yeah, explaining computers with Chris. That's a, that's a good source of information. Watch that quite regularly. False text. Well, again, not sure. Gonna have to make a point of watching that. Okay, uh, Glass TTY. So this is John's site or YouTube page. Uh, some really good content on there, especially if you're into uh, old school view data or packet radio stuff like that so uh, yeah definitely recommend checking that out okay and i'm not going to waffle too much more on this let's just get through some more of these lgr of course oh oh there you go and there's me, Retro Tech Shed.
So thanks for that, Brian. That's fantastic. Uh, Wi-Fi sheep. It's good content on there. Our nostalgia nerd as well. Oh, and retro man cave. Yeah, you got you got a good selection here. Fantastic. Okay, so that's just a few pages from there. Uh, I think also it's worth having a quick look at the about pages. The um, the write up is actually worth a read, explaining how it's been done and. When I edit this video, I'm going to I'm going to show a couple of um, or include a couple of extra pictures. So this is the the Night Owl BBS host computer. Um, we got a regular BBC Master One Two Eight. Um, no fancy add-ons or, or any really mad upgrades inside or anything. Um, there is my way less in there, and there's a co-processor, but. None of that's necessary to run the board. Um, for storage, we've got um, we've got a SCSI hard disk here. That's it was built for me by Kenlow. Um, it uses the Beeb SCSI host adapter designed by Simon Inns, uh, and Ken basically built his own board based on that design, which fits with the drive itself into this five and a quarter half height frame. So it's all nice, nice and tidy, um, and it does a wonderful job. Um, I think it's a one gig drive itself, but obviously with the limitations of ADFS, um, that cuts things down to about half a gig. So, um, but it's more than enough for for my needs here. So that's all fine. Above that, you can see the US Robotics Curio modem. Um, this is the V everything model, so it was kind of like the Ferrari of the 90s modems, if you like. It could handle almost any speed, any protocol. Um, it's a really brilliant modem. Yeah. So I'm using that for dial-up access, and it does. It, it, it can, you know, it can perform auto answer no problem at all, even with the BBC and its limited five inputs. Um, so that's that. Moving over here, we've got uh, probably the most important thing is the modem itself for TCP IP, which is a Raspberry Pi 4. Um, so I've got a regular Raspberry Pi 4, this one's got 8 gig of RAM in it and a 32 gig SD card. Um, and I've installed inside that, there's a terrific program called TCP Sir. Um, and it's the Fostex version, Chris Osborne's version of that. TCP Sierra itself was designed and created by a guy called Jim Brain um, a good while ago. Um, it's had a few, a few amendments by various people. So the version that Fostex has created is really ideal. There's a lot of bugs been taken out of it, um, and it works great in this application. Um, it's um, the TCP set itself turns a Pi 4 or any other computer into a compatible Haze modem that takes its inputs and outputs onto the internet. So you can use it with with you know any computer you like um, and with any old package you like, which effectively you can take that. Something like Comstar, for example, and you can easily use that to access um, BBSs, even general browsing on the internet using TCP Sir. Um, coming out of the back of the Pi from a USB port, USB port, you can see this gizmo here. Now this is the a USB to RS four two three adapter made by a guy called Colin Granville. Um, it's a brilliant little device and it's really just a, a USB serial adapter but it does a great job for me here. Um, 
I wasn't always too sure what I was actually buying when I bought this thing. Um, but for 15 quid, I can highly recommend it. It's a really, really, really cherished peripheral of mine now. Um, I've used it for all sorts of things. Um, and what else? Um, the software itself. So, this is Premiere, written by Chris Royal. Um, Chris came out with this in 1990, I believe. Uh, Chris was something of a, a boy whiz kid coding in his day, in his teenage years. He started off with a, a really clever program called Car BBS, which had about four or five versions. And eventually it developed into Premiere. So if you uh, if you want to play with some old school view data services, then there's two options for you. And they're integrated into the uh, the War Games suite, if you like. So um, so it should be pretty straightforward. There you go, disconnected. Uh, whilst we're looking at online services, let me show you another one. So option G, we're going to go for Simulant this time, and this time I'll mute my mic whilst we dial it. Amstrad.simulant.uk make a whole load of retro computer peripherals from Wi-Fi modems through to old school retro style keyboards, you name it, loads of good stuff. So definitely worth checking uh, checking out Simulant's website. The BBS is based on Synchronet. It's very common, of course, Synchronet, but. Um, but I tend to use it when I'm testing old school retro computers. Plug my Wi-Fi modem in to a serial port, make sure I can get online, use it to send emails, do whatever. So if I just log in here using my account, so there's various file areas on there and whatever else. Um, I'll show you one pretty cool feature though, it's fairly standard on most Synchronet BBSs as long as it's been implemented. So if we go to E for email, um, we can do a net send, give it an email address. Okay, so if we got that right. All right, test from games terminal okay All right and then it's just control Z to end and that should have gone okay and then we can O to log off there yep done let's go back to the dialer for a minute we're going to scan. Now, previously you couldn't change the area code. It was uh, it was actually hard coded into the uh, the dialer program. Uh, and one of the requests was, could we could we change it so that we could um, or could we modify the program so we could change the uh, the area code? I'm like, yeah, sure, we can do that. So now. Um, 311 is the default when you install the software, but if you want to change it to something else because you want to change your numbers to use something else, some other sequence, not a problem. So we can just change it here to, I don't know, whatever we want, 555, let's say. Okay, you've got the option to save it as the default or no. Um, so if you say no, then next time it will default back to 311 or whatever it was last that you, you, you saved it as. Um, you can set the start and end numbers, so we'll just go, I don't know, 100 to 105, okay. You can change the prefixes as you could do previously 
if you don't change them, if you just hit return, it'll use the ones that are set as default. As shown here, 399, 437, 767, 936, they're the defaults from the movie. The reason they're shown, incidentally, is just as an aid memoir. But now, you don't have to bother typing them back in again. Just skip through it. Previously, it didn't actually dial the DTMF tones, but that's another change that I've made since the last video. I've included a, a DTMF dialer. Yeah, also, there's some new samples in there. I'm not sure the uh, the ringing sample's quite right, so if anyone's got a view on that, please let me know in the comments. Let's come back out of there, back into view. We've got one dummy entry here, so H, system. Now, one thing it didn't do before was when you hit a dummy system, it would still go through the motions of connecting and then it just wouldn't do anything. And it occurred to me, well, that didn't actually make much sense. Um, if you're hitting a dummy system that doesn't really exist, then we want a different result, which I'll show you in a second. So basically, anything that's still as default and called just system in lowercase, as opposed to having a, an actual name, uh, this is how it's going to behave. Okay, sorry, it wasn't that exciting, but basically you'll, you'll just get um, an engaged tone, um, which I figured make, made a bit more sense. So let's just connect to Whopper. Okay, so we're at the login prompt. We can do help, help games, list games. Real, real quick then, let's just go through it just once. Well, I guess there's a chance that someone hasn't seen any of the uh, the previous videos, so they may be interested. Okay, so we get to this point, we can log in using our backdoor account, Joshua. Okay, and we can go through the usual script with Whopper or Joshua, but let's just type help for a second and see what we got. So, help list, date, time, DEF CON, author we know about, uh, users, ARPANET, internet. Okay, so let's have a look at users, and we'll just list some. Here's a few I prepared earlier. So previously, your options when you created users were access level one or access level two. One was a standard user, two was a sysadmin. Um, I've changed that now so they can be one through to five. Um, two and four don't do anything special at the moment. When I think of a reason for for two and four, then we, we can use them. We'll put some updates in and restrict access to certain services for, for those access levels. But at the moment, Five is a, a sysadmin, three is a privileged user, and one is a common or garden user that pretty much has access to not a lot. That's pretty much it. Obviously, the, the code's been updated so that the checks are slightly different. We've still got all the usual options, create users, amend users, delete users. So if I come out of there, and I'll go back in again, Okay, so this time I'm going to log in using my account. Okay, so we've got the splash screen there. I think we might have had that last time, can't remember. Okay, and I'm a level five access, as you can see on the screen, so I can get into users, list users, do all the usual stuff. Okay, we'll come out of there. Uh, I can also go into 
back door. If I want to disable the uh, the back door Joshua account, I can literally just press zero to disable that. And if we come out of there, connect again. Okay, this time we'll try and log in as Joshua again. So that's what disabling the backdoor account does if you hadn't seen it previously. Okay, this time we'll log in using a different user account. Okay, so this time we'll log in using Emma's account. Okay, you get the same splash screen, and it's telling you that Emma's uh, an access level three. So if we try and go into users management, no, permission denied, access level required five. So that gives us that additional flexibility to be able to control who can do what. Um, similarly, if we go into back door, no nope, permission denied access level five required. Okay, um, if we try and go into, well, let's connect to the internet. Yep, we can do that as a level three. Okay, let's just prove that works. Yep, that's all fine. So we connect to the internet to level three, but let's just quit out of there. Okay. Mail we've looked at before, but just to prove the point, there you go. We can go into mail and there's one that I sent earlier. And we can send consent items there it is and I still might enhance that so that we've not got the same limitations so you can actually write a full email including carriage returns but I've not had time yet maybe you want to get get a few minutes <laughs> okay so we'll come out of there let's go in as a level one Okay, so let's connect again. Okay, and this time we're going to connect as Fred, because Fred's a level one. Okay, so if we go into users, you won't have access to do that. If we go into uh, internet, no, nope, not got access to do that either. Same thing for ARPANET, not got access to do that. Mail, yeah, he does have access to send mail. Well, use mail, so recipient. Let's put in a non-existent one like, uh, I don't know, Boris. No, user does not exist, that's what we'd expect. We create another one this time to someone that does exist, Andy. Oops. It's nice to have my backspace key. <laughs> Back again. Okay, so there you go, sent. So emails are working fine. And if we just pull up the help menu, uh, should still be a run tic-tac-toe. Uh, 
where am I with work? Okay, let's just prove the point. Tic tac toe. Yeah, that works as well. We'll have a quick one player game on there. CLS will work as well. Okay, so we'll exit from there. I think that kind of demonstrates the permissions at least. And what else we've got to show you? Oh yeah, extra um, options for the global thermonuclear war, war game. So if we go in again as option I, Okay. It does help when you're logged on. <laughs> so at this point then we can have our chat with Joshua or we could just type in global thermonuclear war or we could type in help and we could use all the usual commands. Okay, so now we've gone through the uh, the initial script. It won't let you do that again, by yes, the way. Yes, I do. You want? Once you've had the chat with with Joshua, it keeps track of what's been said, and it won't let you repeat it. But you can still run global thermonuclear war and go back in. So either way, we're going to go for Soviet Union. Primary targets. Okay, so we're we'll putting our primary targets. In fact, let's just do one. Okay, so we'll put in Las Vegas. It's return again if you finished. You can put in up to four, put in less than four, no problem. Okay, so it'll list out your primary targets. It always had the option L to launch. What I've done is I've added in a couple of extra options, E to edit targets or X to exit. So we can show you how this works, I think. If we press X for exit, because I've decided I don't actually want to uh, go through the rest of the simulation. Okay, that'll literally just drop me back out to the, uh, the prompt. Um, and to prove that's working, if I type help, there we go. Now, if I type hello again, it won't restart the chat script because it knows we've already done that. So if you decide, well, actually, I want to play the game after all, not a problem. Type in global thermonuclear war and you're back in. Website, do you want? primary targets okay so this time we'll type in a couple of these okay right so that's listed out the two targets that we specified if we press E to edit it won't let us edit them independently or individually, I'm afraid. That was just going to be a little bit too much hassle to code. But what it will do is it'll take us back around the loop and it'll let us re-enter them. Okay, so this time we can put in the full four if that's what we want to do.
Okay, now finally we can hit L for launch. Okay, and to continue. We're sorry. You have reached a number that has been disconnected or is no longer in service. Okay, so if you've seen the previous video, you'll know the script. Um, even though our session's been disconnected, Whopper calls us back. Okay, I'm going to rattle through this because we've already done all of this on the previous video. If you haven't seen that one, uh, I'll include a link in the description on this one so it'll be easy to find. Sorry to hear that, Professor. Yesterday's aim was interrupted, although primary goal has not yet been achieved. Solution is near. You should know, Professor. You programmed me to win the game. Of course, I should reach DEFCON 1 and launch my missiles in 28 hours. Would you like to see some projected kill ratios? Yeah, and he'll show us anyway whether we want to or not. You are a hard man to reach. Could not find you in Seattle and no terminal is in operation at your classified address. DOD pension files indicate current mailing at Dr. Robert Hume, a.k.a. Stephen W. Vulcan. Tall Cedar Road, Goose Island, Oregon. Okay, so we're riding out the uh, the simulated attack and we're getting no impact. Again, if you've seen the previous video or if you're familiar with the film, you should know what this is uh, all about anyway. Okay, and now WAP is uh, effectively trying to to guess the uh, the launch code himself. Okay, there you go. It's got the code. So then we're into the tic-tac-toe game. Um, we've already played that one player, so we don't need to do that again. But um, if we select number of players zero, and then the number of games.
Must be caught in the loop, storing more and more power from the rest of the system. Okay, well that got there a lot sooner than I was expecting. Well, that's fine. It proves the point anyway. Um, it's probably because I'm running uh, capture on the machine and a whole host of other things that I wouldn't do usually. But anyway, it doesn't matter. That's <laughs> kind of good news that it got there sooner rather than later. Okay, uh, and then we're back to greetings, Professor Falcon, at which point I can type in whatever I want. James Dunn. The only winning mood is not to play. How about a nice game of chess? Okay, and um, that's it. That's basically the end of the game. As I said on the last video, you can go around playing around with whatever you want. You can do some user management. You can mess around on, on ARPANET, internet, whatever you want. Anyway, for now, guys, thanks very much. I will catch you on the next one. Cheers.